Well, good morning and welcome to worship at First Baptist Church of Martinsville on this first Sunday of the new year together. I'm glad, glad that you have found space among us to worship God. Today we celebrate Epiphany Sunday. This is this celebration of Epiphany actually falls on January 6th, so yesterday. But on the first Sunday in January, we gather together to remember the arrival, arrival of the Magi to worship the child Jesus together. This Advent and Christmas season, we followed the star together with many of the characters in the story of Christ's birth, from Mary and Joseph to the shepherds and the angels. And today, we arrive in Bethlehem with the Magi. Having followed the star to the incarnation of God on earth, the Christ child, come to bring light and hope into our world. So may we too, in this hour of worship, bring our own gifts to the Son of God and worship the King. Today we will share in communion together. Uh, those of you online, I hope that you will gather your prepackaged or uh, otherwise elements to have communion alongside us this morning. I know we have a great bit of sickness going around, so I'm grateful for all of you who are well enough to be with us and those of us joining us online as well. I do have a couple of announcements for us this morning. First, our very hardworking flower committee is asking for your help this year as they seek to improve and add to some of our worship materials from replacing our Christmas trees and a couple of our pyramids to adding worship banners for our sanctuary for the liturgical seasons. You will see in your bulletin today and in your e-news their wish list. And if you would like to donate for one of these or a couple of these in honor or, or memory of someone, I ask you that you just contact Mary or Kaylee in the church office to make your donation. We also continue our pledge campaign for 2024. If you haven't had a chance yet to submit your pledge due to the busyness of the holidays, I would encourage you to this week take a moment and send that in to Kaylee so we can update our pledge totals for this year. Also, if you have not picked up your offering envelopes, they are available in the bell tower. Tomorrow on Monday, we will gather to take down our Christmas decor as this this Epiphany Sunday is our last hurrah of these beautiful decorations we've had up. Uh, if you are able to come and join, uh, you will see the time listed in your bulletin and your e-news. And then on Wednesday, uh, we ask that once all of the little pieces are down, you help us come take down the trees. If you're able to do either of those, we hope that you will come and join us. Also, you see in your bulletin a thank you. A thank you from our WMU Admissions Committee for your generosity to our Christmas offering to Heifer International this year. We raised $1,551, and because we turned it in by December 31st, it was matched four times, so over $6,000 that provided much-needed, sustainable support to communities in need. So thank you, church. We also continue our Warming Center and Patrick Henry Elementary School donations. If you would like to donate, you can drop off at the missions room. Also, if you are able to help us deliver some of these donations periodically, if you could let the church office know and we will sign you up for a schedule for that. So thank you, church, for living out Jesus' command to serve the last and the least. Now let us call ourselves together in worship in God's presence. Would you join me in reciting the call to worship found in your bulletin? Arise, shine, for your light has come. We are called out of the darkness into light. Lift up your eyes and see the guiding star. We follow it here to the child. Come, let us worship the God who brings light to the world. We come to the child. Would you pray with me? Holy and mysterious God, who revealed oneself through the light of a shining star, reveal to us today the word that you've placed on our hearts as we gather together to worship you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is kingdom, power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able and to join as we sing hymn number 181, As With Gladness Men of Old, hymn number 181. Our Old Testament reading is Isaiah, chapter 60, verses 1 through 6. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from far away, and your daughter should be carried on the nurse's arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold, frankincense, and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel lesson comes from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. Then King Herod heard, when King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he informed them, inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least upon the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me words so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star that had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Would the children come up front and join me for our children's message? Good morning. Oh, they're coming. <laughs> yeah, come sit down. Good morning. Oh. <laughs> so today, can y'all guess who we're going to talk about? Who are they? I, I know. We're going to talk about the shepherd and the star. The shepherd? Not quite. So we are going to talk about the star, but who, like, let's see. They're wearing hats. Who do you think we might be talking about? We might be talking about um, frankincense and, and mercy. We're going to be talking about the magi. Would y'all like to hold one? You want to hold both? Okay. You want to hold the camel? So we are going to go on a journey with the Magi because they saw a star rise. And they knew that this was a super special star. And they knew that this star, okay, listen, Maria. They knew that this star represented the savior of the people. So let's go on a journey. Let's take the Magi on a journey. Follow me. So they followed the star. Come on. Follow the star. They probably went through mountains and through rivers. Come on. Maybe even through some deserts until they found the star resting. Where? Who is this? This is Mary and Joseph, and we're pretending that this is Jesus. Because Jesus was probably like two years old because the journey took so long. And when the Magi found Jesus, what did they do? They presented him with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which are like fancy oils. So we, during this time, here, let's sit down again. We can sit right here. 
Oh, we're going to sit right here. So during this time, we have the star as a symbol to remember that Christ is with us. Because this, we're celebrating Epiphany. Can you say Epiphany? Epiphany. Epiphany. Where we remember that Christ is with us and Christ revealed himself through the star. Okay, let's pray. Would you pray with me? Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving us. And help us remember that you are always with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Very good. It's time to go to Children's Church. I invite you to again stand and to raise your voice in song with him, number 186. Wise men, they came to look, number 186. As we stand as we are able. of the world. We have been called to follow the star of promise. Like the Magi, let us bring our gifts to honor the babe of Bethlehem and bring light to all the dark places in our community and our world. Will you pray with me? 
God of light and promise, we bring our gifts to further your work in a dark world. May they bring your light to those overwhelmed by darkness, pain, and loneliness. Accept these gifts of money and time, indeed the very gifts of ourselves. Light them sh let them shine for all to see and be brought into the sphere of your love and your righteousness. We ask this all in the name of the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Amen.
You know, the 12 days of Christmas are pretty exciting. 12 days of Christmas actually begins on Christmas Day, in case you didn't know that. And it counts the days through to January the 5th. So this historic church tradition to wait a beat for the Magi to find the child Jesus, it kind of makes sense. After all, Matthew tells us that the Holy Family was already in a house in Bethlehem. There's no more manger. The innkeepers have already found space for them. It may have been anywhere from a few weeks to a couple of years since the birth of Jesus. So the church waits too, from December 25th to January 5th, and then welcomes the Magi to the Christ child on the Feast of Epiphany, which is on January the 6th. The name Epiphany actually means revelation. And in the case of our story today, it's the revelation of God and Christ to the Gentile world. And you know, it's a pretty monumental moment for us non-Jews. This is the story that tells about how even those outside the fold of Judaism had a foothold in God's work in this world in a powerful new way now. Now, for my family, I spent the first eight days of Christmas traveling, celebrating with family all over the state of Georgia. And after a week and a half of traveling all over the southeast, I can't help but understand a little better the story of the Magi. At the holidays, I often find myself acting just like them. I bear gifts. I traverse afar. I pop in with two or three gifts, and then I depart, sometimes even by a different route. And you know, I love the story of the Magi and all that it, all the pieces of it. It's, it's fascinating, and it's not only because of my time studying abroad in Spain and college, where Epiphany is a far bigger celebration than Christmas Day. It's, it's because of all of those interesting pieces of this story of how the Magi come to pay homage to Jesus. One of the most powerful to me, though, is what this revelation to the Gentiles really meant to those early hearers and readers of the Gospels. I mean, it is pretty telling that the most Jewish of our four Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, takes great pains in chapter 1 in the genealogy, and then again here in chapter 2 to include foreigners and practitioners of other religions as those who led up to the birth of Jesus and now those who take most seriously the birth of the new king. Matthew is opening that circle of salvation to include all the nations just as God had promised to Abraham when he was told, you will be a blessing to all nations. Now, there are some things we should know about these foreign magi, or as we like to call them, the three kings or the wise men. First off, the magi were not likely kings at all. They probably worked for kings. They may have been wealthy. But what they did for kings was predict things using the stars. They were basically astrologers. And, you know, good religious Jewish folks didn't want them anywhere near the Messiah story. Yet here they are. Some other things to note. There probably weren't just three of them. There could have been many. A whole caravan, even. There may have been women and men, men alike among them. The traditional count of three, of course, comes from those three gifts that are named. They also weren't necessarily all that wise either, at least not in the biblical sense. Being a magi, which is the plural form of the Greek word magos, it meant having some insight into stargazing. They were considered diviners or magicians. That word magos is actually where we get our word magic from. The stargazing might have been what we would consider kind of an early form of astronomy, but it would have been mixed with all kinds of mythical religious undertones and probably was roundly discouraged by the Jewish faith. So, here are these astrologers. 
believing in major astronomical events that signal important things happening, including the birth of kings. And they saw something cosmic in Bethlehem and headed in that direction. But you notice they don't get the luxury of turn-by-turn -turn directions as they follow this star. They have this vague celestial event, which maybe was a supernova, Jupiter and Saturn in conjunction, a comet, something else, we really don't know. But they figure out that the general direction of Bethlehem is where they need to be. Yet, they don't quite make it. They need to stop in Jerusalem and ask for directions. So they go where the king is, which makes perfect sense, because if celestial events are pointing to the birth of kings, then go find the current king. And there they find Herod. Now this is not the Herod of the passion narrative down the road. It's actually his father. And this guy is a paranoid megalomaniac, as we find out in this story and the story that follows. He's also not real bright, at least not about his own faith. All he hears in this moment is these astrologers, these harbingers of new kings, saying there's some other person being born called the king of the Jews, and it's a name that Herod would like to keep for himself, thank you very much. And Herod seems to have no idea what his scriptures say about the Messiah, and so he calls on his scribes and priests to figure it out for him. Then, of course, he realizes that they have an answer. They say they have read the prophetic scrolls. They confirm it's Bethlehem that the Messiah must be born in. But now Herod couldn't believe that this new birth, that this was a Messiah, this was a chosen one or a king, or he won't believe it anyway. And he asks about the timing of the star so that he can confirm some awful plans to do away with any child born around the time of that star's rising. I read one pastor who talked about just how crazy the story of the Magi and their encounter with Herod really was. He said these were Magi, astrologers. So there you have it. Body, theologically kooky humor at the very beginning of the Jesus story. A Libra, a Pisces, and a Taurus, gazing at their star charts, found Jesus, while Herod's Bible scholars missed the Messiah entirely. I think it's pretty telling how these two different groups respond to hearing about the birth of a new king, about the birth of this Messiah, this promised one. Upon hearing about the birth of Jesus, Herod and all Jerusalem with him, he was drumming this up, y'all, was filled with fear. Yet while upon seeing the child, seeing the star even, before seeing the child, the Magi are filled with joy and kneel down to worship. The former dean of my seminary, Alan Culpepper, wrote, The Magi could not find the king they were looking for until they heard from those who knew the scriptures. But those who knew the scriptures did not recognize the sign that the Messiah had been born. So here is a meeting of two worldviews. Jewish and Gentile, devout and pagan. The seekers could not find the Christ without the guidance of those who had the scriptures. But why did only the group of Magi go to Bethlehem? The Magi were looking for the Messiah. But the Jewish religious leaders did not join them in the search. A new era was dawning, but those who had the scriptures missed it because they did not join with the Magi in their quest. You know, as a religious person with a specific religious tradition, I think that I and many of us will sometimes miss opportunities to know God fully if we silo ourselves off from God's spirit and the way it moves among us in new ways we were never expecting. Herod's scribes certainly missed an opportunity here. And I wonder if occasionally we do as well, if we aren't making connections with people of different faiths, different faith practices. Sometimes I, when I listen to people of another faith speak about Jesus or my own faith, 
I learn something new about the mystery of God and how God works in the world. This is why I keep dialogue open with different faith traditions. I know that I will get too comfortable in my own beliefs if no one outside them ever questions me. I'll be so sure of myself that I won't have the proper humility to hear God's voice when my own beliefs and assuredness fills my head and drowns out God's voice. I think that listening and watching like the Magi is what we're called to do when we see Christ in our own lives. We won't find Christ until our hearts and minds are open, until our doctrines are examined, and yes, perhaps even changed. As we hear God through scripture and reason and tradition and prayer, until we aren't so preoccupied with keeping the status quo of church life, until we are more open to the ways the gospel, this amazing and powerful story, can assimilate into different cultures and transform lives in many different ways and places. I think if we keep worrying about our own faith changing or transforming as we seek Christ's presence, we're going to lose that wonder that the Magi had. And we might just miss a major work of God in this world because of it. With the coming of the Magi, God invited the whole world into a new covenant. This child in human form is for all people and drew visitors from this strange land of the East, even as God's own followers in Jerusalem missed the sign. This child was to grow to unite us, not divide us. This child would grow up to inaugurate and rule a kingdom that was unlike any other, one that would illuminate this world with holiness and righteousness. This child should inspire our wonder, and we should marvel, and we should walk away from our stubbornness, our anxieties, our fears. At the beginning of the Gospels, the Gentile Magi come to worship the, the Jewish Jesus. And by the end of this gospel, the disciples are being taught to go out and make disciples of all nations. And in between, this child grows to teach us something pretty powerful about God's salvation for this world. That it is for everybody. Matthew's gospel, despite tying Jesus' birth in with the house and line of David, despite tying it to ancient Jewish prophecies and seeing the foretelling of Jesus' arrival in his own faith, Matthew also strikes a very universal kind of tone. Right here at the beginning, there are women and foreigners and people of ill repute highlighted in Jesus' lineage. And then there are foreign astrologers who believe more rapidly than the priest and the scribe. As one pastor put it, Matthew is giving a gospel sneak preview here. The Christ child who attracted these odd magi to his cradle will later have the same magnetic effect on Samaritans, immoral prostitutes, greasy tax collectors on the take, despised Roman soldiers, and ostracized lepers. Matthew, too, is truly an epiphany for any and all who tend to think that salvation is a members-only club the adherents of which are easily recognizable to those of us in the know. As we follow the star to Bethlehem today, I wonder if we might take a moment to ponder, to examine our own prejudices and worries. Who are today's magi? What kind of people make us uncomfortable or upset when they wonder, when they watch, when they seek, and when they come to the Christ child as the Magi did? Is it the undocumented migrant fleeing violence and struggling to find their place in our midst? Maybe it's the struggling mom who can't keep her bills paid and relies on government assistance because 
She's routinely got more month than money. Maybe it's the person with loose morals, or at least whatever that means to us. Maybe they drink too much or gamble or sleep around. Maybe they're addicted to drugs, can't hold down a job. Maybe they cheat or steal. Maybe it's any number of those on the margins of our society, the poor and the outcast and the oppressed, our brothers and sisters of color, the LGBTQ community, our neurodivergent neighbors, our handicapped or differently abled-bodied neighbors. The list could fill this sanctuary. Jesus' birth brought out the last and the least to come and pay homage. Foreign astrologers, people who didn't know anything about God or God's Messiah, practicing a whole other faith in another land. And Jesus' life and teaching brought the last and the least expected to the table. The poor, the foreigner, the Samaritan, the other faith, the thief, the cripple, the lame, the blind, and the list goes on. I think we have this habit as Christians of assuming we have some idea of who's in and who's out in this kingdom that Christ came to bring among us. And yet, the Gospels keep surprising the most religious people in the stories with what these religious people considered egregious examples of people that Jesus, that is Emmanuel, God with us, warmly welcomed to the table and into the fold. As you know, even though the Magi probably weren't with the shepherds and the angel, angels at the manger, a lot of time passed between those two events, I still love a traditional nativity set because it has all the characters present together from all the different gospel stories. And it reminds us of this hodgepodge of all kinds of different people standing at the cradle, worshiping and excited to share this good news of God's grace with the whole world. As we enter a new year, I think we have an opportunity as a church to think about how wide open our front door will be, how wide open our hearts are to seeking the powerful work of God through the most unlikely people among us. I hope that we will embrace this amazing story of the Magi and God's wide welcome in our own lives, remembering to relish the joy of being loved as we journey together to the child born in Bethlehem. Our bulletin is a little bit out of order today. I thought I would get that out of the way first Sunday out of the year. Uh, I invite you to stand as you are able and to join in singing number 186, Wise Men, or I'm sorry, 185, We Three Kings of Orient are number 185. Stand as you are able. <clears throat> Oh, 
Today we come to the Lord's table, welcomed by a God who reaches beyond our borders and walls and into our very hearts and lives. I remind you that this table around which we gather is for all Christians. It's not my table, it's not First Baptist table, it's the Lord's table. If you believe in Jesus as Lord, then you are welcome here. God provides abundant mercy at this table, and I hope that you will receive it with us. I do believe that when we approach this table, we do show with a sense of awe and also responsibility. Here, we not only remember Christ's life, death, and resurrection, we also remember that we are not perfect, yet we are loved. So looking in your bulletin, Will you pray together with me a unison prayer of confession, a time to admit where we have fallen short and receive the grace of God anew? God of light, we confess that we have gone astray and have left your light. Instead of following the star to Bethlehem, we follow the dim lights of the world of success and fortune. We follow the dim lights that call us to be more religious by following rules. Forgive us for not seeking the true light of your love for all the world. Forgive us for not following the ways of Jesus who commanded us to love one another. Call us to be light bearers of love, compassion, and justice in which the mystery of your love is revealed. We ask this in the name of the light of the world. Amen. As certain as the dawn follows the night, so is the promise of God's forgiveness and love for us all. Arise and shine. Follow the star. Find the babe born in Bethlehem, the light of the world, and be transformed from darkness into light through God's forgiveness.
holding your communion in your hands, let us remember together. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus gathered with his friends over a meal of regular food and drink. And after he had blessed the bread, he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Each time you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. This is the bread of heaven. Take and eat. In the same way, Jesus took the cup. And after he had given thanks for it, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Each time you eat this bread or drink this cup, you remember the Lord's death until he comes again. Friends, this is the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Drink and remember. Will you join me now as we give thanks to God in unison prayer of thanksgiving, which you can find in your bulletin. God, we give you thanks for leading us here through the light of your Son. We give you thanks for including all those we might fail to include, for we too were once without your light. Thank you for the Magi's witness to your welcome through Christ. Thank you for calling us from exclusivity to inclusivity in your love. Amen. Now, as God's beloved children living in community, would you stand, stretch across the aisle, take your neighbor's hand or elbow as we join together to sing, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. <laughs> 